Let's talk to Bridget Simmons, who's the chair of the Betting and, and Gaming Council. Uh, Bridget, morning. Good morning, Nick. I, I suspect you've heard what, what Neil Channing has been saying here. Um, how do you, as a council that represents the interests of, of bookmakers here in the, in the UK, approach government now? Do you have to be seen to be somewhat non-interventionist or do you just lobby hard? Uh, we have to work with everybody and I hope we will work with the horse racing industry, with individual MPs. I mean, I think we've got to be really careful at this stage not to have too much misinformation. I mean, we're keen for this to be balanced, proportionate, but above all, evidence-led. And I was listening to not this channel, but another racing channel where the commentator said, of course, there's been this increase in advertising, which has led to a huge increase in problem gambling. I mean, there is no evidence that that's the case. The evidence on problem gambling is that it's been around 0.5% for the last 20 years. And actually, in advertising, you know about the whistle-to-whistle -whistle ban that we introduced five minutes before, five minutes after advertising. I mean, that's to reduce the exposure to young people on television by about 97%. So it's got to be evidence-led. Uh, this issue of affordability is really important. And at the moment, we've got a slight disconnect, I fear, between the Gambling Commission, which has got a consultation on 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 um on affordability, uh, which is meant to end, you're meant to put in your evidence by the 12th of January, although we have said that it's far too short, that doesn't fit with government convention of three months and they should be extending it to the 12th of February. Um, but what we, I, I, where I think you're absolutely right is we will be in a position where people will walk away. If people start asking them for their tax return, somebody suggested, I mean, I wouldn't share my tax return with anybody. Um, and whether I wanted to bet or not, we will be driving people to a black market. And we'll be driving people to a black market. We already know from PwC that 200,000 people took part in black market activities, unregulated activities, essentially elsewhere in the world in 20. 2019. We will be doing what they've done in Sweden, which is now I think the numbers are up to about 40% of people because they've made it too tight. So at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that we come out with something that's got balance. I do just want to talk to you a little bit about problem gambling because there's been some contention this week between Michael Duggar, your, your chief executive, who was in debate with ITV's Richard Hoyles about whether problem gambling had increased. And you're talking about evidence-led review. Certain charities, uh, addiction charities, particularly the Gordon Moody Association, they say that during COVID, and this may be a COVID-specific issue, and, and tell me if you think that it is, but the problem gambling had increased, judged on their anecdotal evidence from calls that they were receiving. So they were saying that their calls were going from 30 calls a month to 1,000 calls a month during the period from April to June. Now, w surely the, the betting industry has to take stock of that and not just push it under the carpet and say, that's not true, mm. that doesn't exist, there's nothing to see here, move on. Are you there, Bridget? I think we, I think we may have lost Bridget. <coughs> well, while we, while, we, while we try and get Bridget back, Neil, um, how, what, would you, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, I, in terms of problem gambling, I, I think Bridge is right that generally, uh, you know, levels are quite low. But there is a, obviously the definition of problem gambling is awkward. You know, I, I read something this week where somebody said, uh, well, you know, we define problem gambling and, and they had a whole bunch of metrics. One of the things was like, have you ever regretted having too much on after a, a bet has finished? Well, some people would say, yeah, every time if it loses, you know, like it, it's kind of ridiculous. You, you know, I, I've joked with people in the past that the 20 questions from Gamblers Anonymous, yeah, you know, I've got 18 out of 20 easiest quiz I've ever done. You know, has gambling ever affected your personal relationships? Yeah, the missus sometimes says to me, you know, we were supposed to go to the garden centre and you insisted on watching those those races from Hereford. You know, it's... It, the, the problem gambling is, you're right, everything in this has to be evidence-led, mm. but... You know, when you're talking about affordability, when you're talking about problem gambling, there's not a set way of measuring those things. No. And, uh, you know, it's difficult.
That, so, Bridget, I, you, I don't know if you heard, I think we've got you back now, I don't know if you heard what Neil was saying there. You know, it is, a lot of this is based on anecdotal evidence. That is, that is just the, the nature of, of what we're dealing with here, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't take this anecdotal evidence seriously, does it? If a, if a, a charity is saying no. there is more problem gambling, we have to take that as, as read. Uh, we absolutely do. I mean, I, I did an interview this week about women in gambling and, and one of the charities is saying that there's been an, an increase in those numbers. But what we've got to make sure is that this is... Uh, and, you know, we as an industry have to make sure that we are not preying on vulnerable people. And during the COVID lockdown, we've increased the number of safer gambling messages to our customers by 150%. And without doubt, there's more interventions that we can do. But there are other ways of cutting this issue of affordability. It doesn't have to be all about you have to produce your bank statements. Yes, of course, you've got to produce information. But there's more the banks could do to share information with us. We need to talk to the Information Commission about how we can share information between each other. Uh, there's, there's, there's a holistic way of approaching this, I think, which would be better than simply saying to people, if you don't produce all this information, uh, you're not going to be able to gamble at all. Because as, as, as actually was a member of the House of Lords Select Committee said at, at uh, something I was speaking at with him, if I had £50,000 redundancy and I wanted to spend it on a land bikini, no one would ask me where I got the money from. So we've got to be absolutely careful that we're not intervening in the wrong way with people who actually want to use uh, their money on gambling when 30 million people in this country take part in gambling activities yeah. on a regular basis and the vast majority do so safely. What is that holistic approach, Bridget? What approach would you take? How do you intervene? Because you, you accept the fact there has to be some level of, of intervention or, or care, but you don't want anything too draconian. So what is your holistic approach? Well, we've been doing some affordability trials. I mean, we've been doing them with the Gambling Commission over a period of time. Um, I think that's one of the things, I mean, we've got we've got four months to put in this evidence. It's one of the things that's going to be part of the discussion and whether it could be, it could be, I mean, we do now encourage people to set deposit limits, but it's got to be something around deposit limits. It's possibly got to be a flag system, which again, many operators would have now. There's lots of things I think that individual operators are doing that we could make a, a consistent and a national scheme. But I think what we'd have to make sure is that everybody has to abide by the same rules. So it would have to become part of the LCCP requirements, the, 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 the sort of rules by, uh, by which we all abide. But at the end of the day, we've got to remember it is... I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, they, they talk in the review about giving the Gambling Commission more resources to deal with the black market. But as we all know, in an internet-led age, that is really difficult to do. And you've only got to go now and Google GamStop on, uh, on, on, on tomorrow and you, it will give you 10 different ways to get round signing up to GamStop, which is a way of stopping you spending any money and receiving any advertisements around gambling. So we've got to be... It's ever-present... And we need, but we need to find a balance that doesn't drive people off to that black market, but also encourages the people to be responsible and have a better understanding about risk. Just on the problem gambling front, uh, you know, I've read a lot this week and listened to a lot of people talking about the gambling review. I, I haven't found anybody that's in favour of problem gambling. Everybody says, "Oh, it's great. you know, we've got to do something about problem gambling." It is quite a small issue. Uh, I think, I think you, you know, it's all, there are conflicting evidence, but I, th I, I think you're broadly right to say that it's a, a smallish problem and not a grow and not a hugely growing problem. But this whole idea that, well, it, you know, if we bring in all these restrictions, uh, it's going to stop problem gambling in in uh, horse racing betting or in you know betting generally uh it's not really that's not really the solution is it like people that have addictive personalities find an avenue for their addictive personality if if the government simply make it harder for people who uh, are predisposed to be addicted to gambling uh to do gambling they'll just go and do something else that they're addicted to uh and if there isn't money put in to helping those people uh, in terms of, you know, treatment and, uh, you know, centres and whatever for, for problem gamblers, 
it's a waste of time anyway. We're just pushing the problem on somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, to an extent, I think the whole thing is a slight box ticking exercise from the government's point of view. They want to be seen to be doing something about it. But I, and, and you use the word holistic. Unless they have a holistic approach to problem gambling, just stopping people from doing betting and shoving them either into the black market or into another thing that they're addicted in, and, and giving them no treatment or anything and no spending on, you know, spending on mental health in this country is, is you know, useless in the last 15 years. Uh, so it, I, I, it I, is, uh, yeah. I, I struggle with the, the idea that the government are looking here. to solve problem gambling through this. Well, of course, uh, you know, I, I mean, I came to work in this industry, the alcohol industry, for the last 20 years, of course, alcohol has been dealt with under the NHS. And unfortunately, in gambling, the industry has been the sole funder of research, education and treatment. I mean, the government announced last year that they were going to introduce 22 clinics uh, in the United Kingdom to de help people who had a problem with gambling. So far, they've only put in three. They've obviously been delayed because of COVID, but they do need to introduce those clinics. I've actually visited one of them. The first one that was set up was in Leeds. And you're absolutely right, because what, what you find is people who have a problem with gambling tend to have a problem in other areas. And what we've got to be really careful is that we deal with the whole problem um, and of which gambling may be a very small part. Um, it, it, there's got to be, a, I mean, we've now got much more money also being spent on education. I mean, the Department of Education has insisted that PSHE at schools has gambling, not gambling per se, but has education as far as risk is concerned. And, and the industry has put £10 million into YGAM and GAMCARE, who are either intervening directly with youngsters or who are training teachers so they have an understanding of this. I, I think there's a lot more that we can do in all of these areas without being so draconian on affordability tests. And as you rightly say, uh, people who have problems with gambling often have problems in other areas. And what we don't want to do is to drive them to something else, alcohol, drivers or, or whatever it happens to be. But do you accept, Bridget, that the, the gambling industry must present its product in a way that doesn't in some way encourage problem gambling? The industry has a responsibility to present a a product that is, yes, appealing to the customer, but doesn't in any way induce the customer to become a problem gambler. At the moment, I, I, I fear that we're, we're heading down a, a narrative here that says that there are X amount of people who are predisposed to addiction in this country and gambling is just something that they might get addicted to, rather than admitting the fact that there are certain hooks, triggers, um, bits of bait that can get... that can enable people to become problem gamblers. I think problem gambling is something that could afflict any of us at any given time. Uh, I am free to talk. It is. And I think, uh, you know, we have to admit as an industry and we have admitted that we have not been best in class in the past. But the five CEOs who I took in front of the House of Lords Committee were absolutely clear that safer gambling was at the heart of everything that they are doing now. And it comes from the boardroom downwards. I am sure when we go through this review that there will be more restrictions put in place. And you're right, going back to the very start of this conversation, we need to do more, but we also need the horse racing industry to step up and be quite supportive of us, because that 350 million that we're putting currently into horse racing from the betting industry is going to reduce if there are more restrictions. And we're also going to find at the end of this, if we're going to have levy reform and, and having actually checked with DCMS, what they've said is they are going to look whether it's, it's actually a, at the right time to bring the... Uh, levy reform or bring levy reform a review forward to 2021 they haven't actually said that they're going to review it at this stage that's got to be part of the discussion but we need the horse racing industry to support the betting and gaming industry and, and if they've got concerns please bring them forward um, we want to problem gamblers are a problem for us and it's a problem that we absolutely need to deal with but we also need to work in partnership with the industry to make sure that the product is safe, that safer gambling is at the heart of all our sponsorship agreements, as it absolutely should be. Bridget, thank you very much.
Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.